Hello, this is Daniel Martins with the Apple Maven. And today I'll be speaking with a friend, really. We worked together back at a research shop back in New York City a few years ago. Uh, Dan Ives from Wedbush Securities. Dan, thanks for your time and welcome. No, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Awesome. So Dan, he covers, among other things, he covers Apple stock. And uh, to the best of my knowledge, Dan is, well, he's an Apple expert, and he's the most bullish or one of the most bullish people on Wall Street. Uh, he has a, a buy rating on Apple with a uh, price target of $185, $185, which is pretty much 30% upside from here. So, uh, but before we go big picture, uh, Apple is going to be reporting earnings next week on July 27th. And by the way, the Apple Maven will be live blogging. So feel free to follow us along. But I want to, uh, I want to start with earnings since it's just right around the corner. Um, now, you put out a note, Dan, about a couple of days ago on Wednesday. Now, we know that Apple is going to have some issues in the short term. So fiscal third quarter, uh, we have problems with supply chain, with some backlog of, of components. Even Apple itself talked about it about three months ago with the CFO, uh, Luca Mastri and, and Tim Cook. Um, but in your note, you're saying not only will Apple be fine, uh, you're actually thinking that Wall Street might be a little conservative. So I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about what you're seeing for the short term and what do you think is going to be the most likely part of the business that will kind of help Apple do that well in the short term? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, look, our view this quarter, I mean, look, go back three months ago, right? I mean, the stock was really back against the wall. I think many viewed it, it was the December quarter was probably the best that you're going to see. The March quarter, okay, that that's one more. And then you're just going to see a massive moderation of growth. And it's been the opposite. I mean, if, you, if I look at all of our checks coming out of Asia supply chain, it's been anywhere from solid to something that's almost been a step up in terms of units, especially coming out for iPhone 13, which makes me believe, I mean, this quarter, we're going to be looking a few billion dollar beat probably on iPhone. And I think services also beats. I think you put it all together. I think what the street underestimated, and you know, you you talk about this so so well in in your comments and blogs, really over the last few years, it's what this we'll call it super cycle, upgrade cycle, how massive and how long it is, and I think what if you look today, you still have twenty five percent of the base that haven't upgraded their iPhone in the last three and a half years, which is why I think the big focus in the quarter, it's not just beat it's more just commentary going into september quarter as well as specifically in china because china has really been the linchpin to to what we believe is the sort of iphone growth story playing out awesome i actually want to set that china conversation aside because i want to go back to that for sure um, but still on the iphone um, if i think about everything that's been happening to the iphone in the past I mean, the holiday quarter and the, like you said, and the quarter after that was absolutely amazing for the iPhone. And I have a hard time, and of course, it's, it's hard by design to try to parse out how much of that is uh, stay at home stuff from the pandemic, how much of that is just a regular uh, upgrade cycle because people have old phones. I, I know that you've been talking about uh, the install base being a little outdated and needed a, a, needing a refresh and how much of that is from 5G itself. So people are actually moving to 5G. Do you have a sense of which one is driving it more or is it just equally? What, what are your thoughts there? Well, well, first off, the reason this is the super cycle is because of the penetration story. I mean, going into this, there were 350 million of about, I mean, we're up to about 975, about 950 million that didn't upgrade their phone in three and a half years. Right. So I kind of viewed it at the, at really the beginning and, and even through the middle of it, it was pure install base. Now, 5G, I think that's 10, 12%. Well, as we all know, 5G doesn't really get live and kind of fully embraced till the next two to three years till all the networks get built out, Verizon, AT&T, T-Mobile, and others. I think you definitely are saw from a model perspective, especially what we saw in China, iPhone 12, especially on the larger sort of on the Pro versions, that that's really sold extremely well. And in terms of the pull forward, see, we disagree a bit because a big asset that Apple has, we all know, it's the stores. Go into the stores, test the phone, look at the AirPods, look, 
you had none of that during the pandemic. So you, our argument over the last six to nine months is don't lump Apple in with a pull forward work from home story. To some extent, without the retail piece, I think it's actually net hurt them, which is also why when you look at iPhone 13 coming out of the gates, in terms of coming out of Asia, we think it's up versus iPhone 12 pre-COVID. And that's really, look, and Dan, that's our whole point here is that this is not just one of those cycles and then all of a sudden you, know, you play it going in, you sell it fading. That was the Apple kind of way to play the thesis. Disagree. This is a long day going 22 plus services, hardware, Mac, AirPods coming out. You know, I think this is one, like there's a lot of sort of levers here, which is why I think we sit here a year from now, $3 trillion mark cap. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And actually um, the whole elo- elongated um, thesis that you have, I really like it because if you think about the 5G piece itself, you're right. The, the infrastructure is not necessarily laid out yet or it's just getting started. So maybe we haven't even seen the thick of the, the 5G. But, but that's, that's the whole, that's the crux of it is that this is not like the parties come, it's 2 a.m., the bar closes. I mean, if I think about from a 5G perspective, it's 8 p.m. Yeah. at the bar. Yeah. You know, in terms of where this kind of 5G Apple story is going. That's why, look, and obviously there's some that are just predisposed negative on Apple, yeah. don't innovate. You know, they, they were negative, hated it, going to a trillion, despised it going to two trillion. And on three trillion, they're, you know, they're, they're going to be, uh, you know, yelling and kicking and screaming. Yeah, for sure. Uh, one last thing on the iPhone, though, that I'm, I'm always asking myself, which is, and you, you just mentioned it, that Apple seems to be doing really, really well at the high end, even though Apple hey, launched the, yep, Apple launched the SC not long ago. They just put out the, the iPhone, the purple version, to try to compete at the low end. But the impression I get is that they're really being um, competition at the low end from Huawei and Xiaomi and all those guys really, really tough and they're doing a good job. And then Apple is just completely dominating the top. And I wonder if that's going to be the dynamic. Is that really the sweet spot for Apple? Well, it's premium. It's a premium brand, right? Like in other words, if all of a sudden they started selling good yard pocketbooks at 200 hours, would the brand change? So it speaks to like, it's a premium brand. Now you have to make sure that you don't, they, 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 you have that other part of the customer base, especially, you know, when you go around the world, that they make sure that they have a lower price phone to make sure they don't lose competition. Because if they get a Dan, maybe I can't afford a thousand hour iPhone. So now I'm, I'm getting a lower price point. But then maybe, you know, over the coming years, I could then start to afford a larger one. That's the whole goal of Apple. Get yeah. in the ecosystem. When you talk about the high end, ASPs has been key. You know, once they stop breaking out units ASP, there's always a debate on the street. It ultimately ended up being one of the best things they ever did because the complexity for them to forecast units and ASP has really become crapshoot, right? I think if you look, ASPs continues to trend up, continues to trend up in China, and that continues to be a tailwind. And I think we'll see that again this quarter. Yeah, that's great. That's great for revenues. That's great for margins as well. And I know we could be talking about the iPhone for hours, but I do want to talk about, you just mentioned China again. And China to me is one of the most fascinating stories because if you go back uh, mid 20 teens, right? So around 2015, uh, greater China was about one quarter of Apple's total revenues was just amazing. Just growing out of control was the big story. And all of a sudden it just fell out of the bunk bed. It was just ugly. And China would just went dormant for four years and some analysts were just saying that the China story was over. And all of a sudden, 2020 holiday season uh, through the roof again. So to me, it's always a hard story to, to, to wrap my mind around. Is China a very cyclical market? Is it a bad market that just had a little spike in the holiday? Or is it just coming back strongly? And, and I so kind of assume that I know what your answer is going to be, but let, let me hear your thoughts. But, but, but let's just go back in history. Yeah. So, so let's just kind of walk through. 2014, remember, they're all building out China. It's all about going after retail. They're going to introduce 
why the bigger phones focus on the China market. 2015, massive, especially when you think about going into iPhone 6 and you think about some of their, their biggest product cycles, 231 million units that they had. Then you ultimately had a hole. Many Chinese consumers bought the iPhone. They were, they were not going to be going through an upgrade in the next two, three years. A lot of the models that came since obviously were, I think, underwhelming. But we never, see, we never believed based on our work that the China market was going away. Yeah. I viewed it purely as a timing. And it goes, also goes back to Apple being poster child in the U.S.-China Cold Tech War. You know, the, the view or at least the perception, if you go back, is retaliation, Chinese consumers, they're going to be burning iPhones in the streets. Instead, they were going into Apple stores and buying the iPhones. Yeah. And I think it's, it's very underestimated, and I think not well understood by some, just how entrenched Chinese consumers are into Apple phones, especially when it comes to the high. And that's, look, a big part of our bull thesis has really been around China. That's going to continue to be a sustained growth. And when those talk about retaliation, I mean, Apple's one of the biggest employers in China. I mean, when you, when you look at a typical peak iPhone as well as with suppliers, and it just shows Cook has been able to navigate the Beijing you know, sandbox yeah. extremely well been a big part of the success. Yeah. Yeah. Cook is very talented at that. And, and China might be a, a big deal, especially more in the short term, because their 5G infrastructure is a little bit farther ahead that, than, than yeah. some of the other countries out West. So we might, we might be able to see that cycle kind of play out a little bit earlier too, um, which is great. Uh, now, if, okay, so we talked about iPhone China services, those seem to be usually the, the pillar of most investment thesis. But what we saw now in 2020, and probably in big part because of the pandemic, was the Mac and the iPad just through the roof as well. Um, I wonder if there is a longer term thesis on the, let's call it the, uh, the, the, the side products, you know, the, the, the PC and the tablet. Or do you think that this is one of those things that will actually um, kind of normalize after the pandemic since people, you know, bought their PCs, bought their tablets, you know, bought whatever they needed, and now they're done for a bit? We're just going back to what you talk about with services business. I think that, you know, and this sort of been our thesis the last call five, six years. Like, I think it's been a big part of the re-rating. Mm -hmm. You know, I think traditionally, if you go to Apple as a as an investor, you bought it 12 times earnings, you sold it at 16 times. You go to Philly, you get a cheese steak. And it was like that was kind of the view of how you bought and sold Apple. I think what many missed or underappreciated was that services piece, the value. Mm -hmm. I go back two years ago, I think Valley Street was signed a value 200 billion. Today, I think it's close to 1.3 trillion. The services piece, I think I really much more fully appreciated during COVID. Mm -hmm. And I think you saw that big part of the re-rating. When you look at Mac and you look at kind of like a bit of a renaissance that we saw, definitely a pull forward that we saw with iPads, Macs. I mean, you'll, you'll have you know, pro versions that will come out you know, probably in the next few months. But the M1 chip, I think, has been something that it's been one of the biggest innovations and in stories in Cupertino that I think now is really starting to shine more of a light, that control of the ecosystem. And I think that's been a big part of their success you know, when you look across the hardware ecosystem. Yeah, no, I agree. And and they started with the M1 and they they switched from the Mac to the iPad and they're equipping the iPads with that as well, getting more control, maybe better margins going forward. That's that's a very interesting story too. Yeah, for sure. Um, you you mentioned you mentioned valuation. So um, Apple used to be valued or the stock used to be valued about 12 times, 10 times, not that long ago, less than a decade mm -hmm. ago. And then we had the whole uh, the whole re-rating, we had services becoming a bigger deal. Uh, now, if I look trailing PE, Apple is trading at about 33 times, which is about as expensive as it's ever been, except for the second half of last year. So I guess my question is, and I'll, I'll go back to the business fundamentals, but on the stock itself, how, how do you become comfortable, I guess is the word, with that kind of valuation? Do you think there's more expansion or, or how, how does that play into the thesis? I believe that, well, first of all, I think you have to view it on some of the parts. 
Mm-hmm. I, a straight PE, I don't think captures the value of Apple. And I'm not, that's just not, that, this just not the way we do it. And I think many bulls, I like to look at it on some of the parts. And more and more, it, it, is it a hardware company or is it more of a software services company? How do you value it? And I think more and more, it starts to get valued with the likes of a Facebook, a Google, in terms of the internet multiple as one triangulated way to look at it. But I very simply look at it as, let's just do some of the parts, services, business. Let's call it, you know, as we go into next year, 70, 75 billion. What's the multiple you're going to put on that from a revenue basis? Is it, is it 10 times? Is it 15? And it was like, I view it as like that services business is worth anywhere from 1.3 to 1.5 trillion. Mm-hmm. Then you look at everything else. Hardware, ecosystem, the, that moat that they build in Cupertino. And, and I believe that's worth anywhere between 1.5 and 2 trillion, which is, I think that's the best way to value Apple on a sum of the parts, services, and then the hardware business. And, and I think that's something that some investors will fight. But, but ultimately, I think that's really how the street has started to come to like, you know, if you look split adjusted, right? I mean, you're talking about what's basically a $600 stock here. Yeah. Yeah, I hear you. Now, I, I guess I wonder what happens to that some of the parts analysis once you throw in a something completely different. So an Apple car, for example. And again, we're talking about services and software. If the car comes in, it's a huge, it's a huge hardware-based driven uh, sort of segment. How does that kind of factor into the mix? And then I have a question from a a Twitter user that's basically wants to know is the Apple car coming as far as, as far as you can tell, uh, what's the probability that we might see something within the next five years or so? Yeah. And, and first off, I think the next big prog downs and we win for years, but I think next year is when the mixed VR, AR, Apple glass come out yeah. and then get released, you know, and probably next spring to next summer. So, so I do think that's going to be the next big new product release uh, when I go into next year. When I look at Apple Car, it's it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. You know, I believe they're continuing to kind of build out a vision and infrastructure. They're looking for partnerships. We believe on the battery side. We continue to believe VW is likely probably the biggest OEM that they that they could partner with. They're not going to do it alone. They're going to partner, and they're not going to miss out on a five trillion dollar green title lease. It comes down to like. You know, Apple, its biggest strategic mistake, in our opinion, is, is not buying Netflix, you know, if I go back in the last decade. Yeah. And I think it's very hard to build out that content business piece by piece. And some of that's cultural. We all know Apple doesn't do significant M&A in terms of studios and others. When I look at Apple Car, I view that as just there have been some one step forward, two steps back. Now it's at a point where it's coming. We believe 2000. 24, 2025 is when you actually see the Apple car. But I believe they lay the groundwork over the next three, six, nine months to get there. Yeah. And, and do you think it's too early to try to think about modeling what that might look like, what that might do to margins, uh, what kind of earnings potential you might have? Or do yeah, you know, on the margin extend? side, yeah, to your point, like on the margin side, I think like there's been some concern, like they get into autos, it could crush mar- they're going to partner. In mm-hmm. other words, like it, it, this is not going to be a margin dilutive story in terms of how they attack that area of the market. But I view mixed reality, Apple Car, and, and a lot of these other innovations just additive to the overall valuation. Mm-hmm. It just goes back to the last few years for a company that doesn't innovate. I mean, AirPods could be. I mean, let's say this year they'll do you know, 95 to 100 million units. Like that would basically be, you know, a Fortune 500 company in itself. So I think it just shows it's the install base. It, it comes down to the retention and what they can sell, but also making sure they don't make the wrong strategic picks. Yeah. I think when you look at Apple Car, that's something where I view that as, you know, as a matter of when it comes out and who the partner is. Than if. Yeah. And, and I guess back to Tim Cook being as good a manager as, as he is, 
if, if I were to trust somebody to, to handle this well, because Tim Cook is absolutely obsessed with inventory, with operations. He used to be the CEO of the company before he became the CEO in 2012, I guess. So I guess if there's anybody that will figure it out in a good way, I guess, I guess Apple is a good, uh, is a good bet, I would think. He's been Teflon like, and you know, in my opinion, if you look back in the last 40, 50 years, especially filling those shoes of jobs, yeah. it's hard to come up with. You're looking at a top five list of CEOs. Yep. You know, he's up there, and obviously along with you know Nadella Bezos and some others, but it's what he's done, especially navigating US China cold tech war, supply chain, COVID. Um Definitely some dips from a production perspective, yeah. from a demand perspective, post iPhone six. That's and and you know, he's sort of done it with back against the wall, but stuck to their game plan. And that's how Apple, you know, is the most valuable company in the world. Yeah, for sure. Now let me ask you something. If I take a step back and I know you're very bullish on Apple, and I guess my question would be what do you think could be the biggest risk? So what are you mm-hmm. mostly concerned about? And so I think, you know, yeah, two biggest risks. Uh, yep. One, antitrust slash epic, you know, core battle going after App Store, Golden Jewel. Agree. Any, any issue happens there negatively on the court case, antitrust really starts to get more teeth. Fees come down on App Store. That becomes a risk yeah. because ultimately that's that you know that's been the golden goose. Yes. Now again, I think that's that's a contained risk today, but but it is a risk. And I think right now it's about call it twenty hour overhang of the stock in, in terms of regulatory. Two, it's poster child US China cold tech war. And, and and it continues to be there as a broader risk when it comes to China. I wouldn't say retaliatory, but nationalistic, don't start to buy iPhone. You start to see this sort of battle between you know Beijing and DC continue to step up. I mean, Apple, Tesla, I mean, those are two of the companies that would be caught in the middle. I mean, I think those, those are the biggest risks. I don't view like a chip shortage. It's temporary. Right. Uh, I mean, there's exogenous things that could happen here, but to me, those are probably the biggest risks in the story. Yeah, no, I agree with you. And I think it's fascinating that those risks are not really internal. They're almost like external forces uh, that Apple might not have much control over, but it looks like the business itself has been um, run very well and, and they're just striking it. The iron is hot and they're striking it. It's amazing. Yeah, it's been, especially when you look back the last 18 months, and even when you look back the last three months, I mean, go back. Three months ago, I mean, stocks, you know, whatever, 118 to 120, you know, many thinking, okay, that was it. We went through it, saw the peak. And, and I think part of why the stocks rebound, I think, you know, investors are starting to realize, well, this is an elongated product cycle. Right, right. Awesome. Now, I want to I wanna be sure that we uh, they're within our a lot of time here. And let me just ask you one last thing. So if I could step away from Apple a little bit and you, and you cover other stocks within the sector, what what do you think are some of the best picks? I know that you mentioned in your note that Apple, I, I believe and correct me if I'm wrong, that you think that Apple is, would be a top pick within tech, at least within mm-hmm. mega tech. Um, what do you have in mind? What else is out yeah. there? Yeah, as part of the basket, I mean, Apple is obviously one of our top picks. Uh, from Microsoft, that's our, one of our top cloud names along with DocuSign. And then you really want to circle cybersecurity. And I cannot emphasize covering this, you know, call it 20 years plus, what the threat landscape looks like especially on the shift to the cloud, we love names like Zscaler, CyberArk, Tenable, Veronis. Also, I think Palo Alto is starting to see its next leg of growth along with Fortinet. I think cybersecurity is, especially as we go in the second half into next year, massive area of growth. Yeah, awesome. Love it. Well, Dan, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure for talking me. to you again. And, uh, and I'll, I'll be happy to reconnect again in the future. Thank you. All right.